scripture reads, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Many, O Lord my God, are the, work, are the wonders which you have done in your thoughts toward us. There is none to compare with you. If I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips. O Lord, you know, I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. You, O Lord, will not withhold your compassion from me. Your loving kindness and your truth will continually preserve me. For evils beyond number have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to see. They are more numerous than the hairs of my head, and my heart has failed me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. Make haste, O Lord, to help me. Let those be ashamed and humiliated together who seek my life to destroy it. Let those be turned back and dishonored who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, Aha, aha. Let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified. Since I am afflicted and needy, let the Lord be mindful of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you so much for the teaching that you've allowed us to sit under, Lord, the men that you have brought up to lead us and the fellowship that we have with the common uh, factor of Christ, Lord. As I read this psalm, I, I see a man much like I want to become. I thank you for his example and your work in his life, Lord. I pray that as we read your word and we uh, see somebody who depended upon you, Lord, recognize your sovereignty, and that is why they cried out to you, Lord, and then waited patiently for your response, knowing that you deliver those you love your children, those who trust on you, and you don't just take them from their uh, situations, their dire straits, but rather you set their feet upon a rock and you cause a song of praise to be put in their mouth. Lord, he also proclaimed your goodness, your faithfulness, and of your salvation, and he continued in your loving kindness and your truth. Lord, uh, he prayed for himself, and he also prayed for others. I pray we would be like him. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing. We'll sing by faith.
Galatians chapter 4 will be Galatians 4, 1 through 7. Beginning in verse 1, the scripture says, Now I, as long, I say as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, though he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came... God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Let's pray. For a wonderful promise that we have here, a wonderful truth, Lord, that we're son of God sons and daughters of God, Lord, that we know you, Lord, that you've redeemed us. That we're thankful that you sent your son to the world to redeem sinners. And Lord, we are sinners. You've redeemed many of us in this room today. We're thankful. Pray for those who have not yet experienced redemption. We pray today would be their day of salvation. Pray for Mike as he preaches your word that the power of the Holy Spirit would enable him today and strengthen him to do just that. And that the truth would go forth with the blessing of the Spirit on it. We pray for believers, all of us believers, to respond to the truth in a way that would please you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
If you could move to the center, that'd be great. And, you know, kind of move in a little bit. There's a couple of spots, a couple of people that have come in, and the back is filled and the front is empty. So, and the middle is empty. It's good to see all of you today. Thank you for coming and looking forward to worshiping with you and looking at this amazing passage in God's Word. When we adopted, and when we adopt Samuel into our family, he will come to us with a normal human heart, just like all of us, right? A heart that seeks to earn the favor of people. Adopting children can sometimes make this ever, uh, make it even more uh, present, this idea of trying to earn favor. The lack of love from parents can often leave a huge void in our souls and in our lives. And his uh, desire for affection will only be heightened by how he was ne neglected by his birth parents. Being an orphan for any amount of time definitely has to be difficult on a person, right? They want to be loved. We all want to be loved, don't we, if we're really honest? We want people to show affection to us and, and concern for us and, and, and to love us. And on top of this, Samuel will have the same sinful heart that we are all born with that wants it even more. And he will probably attempt to earn our favor as his parents... He will probably do things to get our attention. This is normal for all children, isn't it? We are all born wanting love from others. And our hearts think we can gain attention or earn love by doing things. Any parent in the room knows what we're talking about here, right? You know when you have a child, the child will often do things to get you to say, good job, or I love you, or... Oh, that's worthy of a hug. We probably shouldn't be saying that, but we do. We present that to our children, don't we? This whole idea of doing things in order to earn our favor. And then our hearts crave attention. Everybody's heart craves that attention, right? If we're honest. And we often will do whatever it takes to get that affection. We have a responsibility as parents to do everything we can, however, when Samuel comes into our home, to love this little boy without conditions. Samuel will need to know we are sacrificially committed to him, not because he earns our love, but rather because we are committed to him unconditionally. We love him whether or not he obeys us even. That's a wild thought, isn't it? He's going to be our child no matter what. Our fathers, the same. This is how our God in heaven is. This is God's love for his spiritual adopted children. Isn't that good news, folks? Our father loves us even though for years many of us have sought the love of false gods by our good works. You understand that before you're a born-again believer, you have a God. <laughs> and often you make idols in your heart. And those idols are sometimes even named Jesus. That's a wild thought, isn't it? Where you try to earn Jesus, this idol that you made in your heart, earn his favor by being a good person. And if you're good enough, you think, oh, well, he likes me. He loves me. And his name can even be Jesus. It's not the Jesus of the Bible. But this is the way the human heart is. That's why all religions as a whole can kind of be boiled down into really two, right? There's true Christianity and then there's everybody trying to be good enough for their idol to accept them. Whatever idol that is. So poor Samuel, when he comes into our house, he's going to have this heart that seeks to be loved. And so he seeks to earn that favor even from his own parents. We have to be careful, don't we? To not... Give him love based on how good or bad, or bad he is. Now, 
But shouldn't we do that? Parents, y'all know what I'm talking about right now. Isn't there a little bit of a grapple there? It, it, do you have sometimes a child, one of the two children you have, or three children, that just has a, 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 an affinity to obey? <laughs> and you're like, oh, that's an easy child to love. <laughs> they, oh, they do what I want them to do always. So, oh, come here. What are we presenting to them? And especially to the other children. We're presenting a God, a father figure, that accepts us based on what we do. We have to be careful of that. God's grace is an amazing grace. However, does God expect obedience? Yes. He wants obedience. But ultimately, he knows we all fail at this miserably, right? Adoption is a beautiful picture of our loving relationship with God, a God that unconditionally loves us. Now, there were conditions, and we'll see what they were, and he met them. <laughs> he met those conditions, but he loved us unconditionally. There are five places in that spiritual adoption are mentioned. We're on our fifth one, and the last one where the word adoption specifically is mentioned. They are Ephesians 1, 5, emphasizing that God predestined us to adoption before time. Romans 8, 15, which talks about killing sin and therefore we're adopted as children where we can call out to God to help us in our sanctification. Romans 8, 23, that talks about what? It's our adoption to come, our final adoption where we will go to glory. And then finally, there's Romans 9 that we went through last week that talks about God's predetermined plan to adopt national Israel. However, not all Israel is Israel. And they are those that he chooses out of Israel to be a remnant, his children, his adopted children. And God chooses that based on his choice, his independent free will choice. And all of us in the room say, amen, we trust you, Lord. And then finally today we come to Galatians chapter 4. So, Sometimes my introductions have been a little long, and I want to apologize for those, and I want you to tell you I, I, I'm not doing this intentionally to, to, to draw out the sermon. I'm, I, there's a reason behind it, and I want you to know it. Is when I drop down into the middle of the book, it's very hard for you to get the context. So sometimes I have to spend a little bit more time at the front so you get the context of the passage. Otherwise, I'm gonna, you're not going to get the whole point of the passage if I don't give you the context. So introductions, when I do a thematic sermon like this are going to be a little bit longer, so y'all bear with me, okay? So take your Bibles and look over at Galatians, and look at Galatians chapter 1. The book of Galatians is a defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Galatians were professing believers in Jesus that Paul had led to Christ during his first missionary journey. The Galatians had been influenced by a group of Jewish false teachers after Paul had left, they are called Judaizers. The false teachers had told the Gentile believers that they were required to follow the Mosaic law in order to really be saved. In other words, okay, you can embrace our Messiah, but you got to do all this stuff in order to really be delivered from God's wrath. And so faith alone in Christ alone was not enough. That's what the Judaizers said. Paul starts in chapter 1 with, a firm rebuke. And a matter of fact, he really doesn't give much, uh, I love you, way to go, I'm thankful for you. He just goes right in and does this. Boom. From the very beginning, lays them out. Notice in 1.6, he states, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed, condemned. Anybody that teaches you, anybody that teaches you that it's based on what you do instead of what Christ has done in faith in him, that person should be 
condemned to hell for eternity. Wow. It's pretty intense, right? How important is it to stick to the gospel? Very important. And some people say, well, why, Mike, do you rail on some of these people and bring up by name people like Joel Osteen? Why do you bring up the Pope? Well, because it matters. The gospel is important. If we don't get it right, beloved, we could end up missing the whole thing. Read the book of Hebrews as we found. We see clearly that doing the works of the law will justify no one. No amount of good works can save you. In fact, the law is a crushing truth, isn't it? It's painful. It may be kept. It may be have kept the children of Israel from being as bad as they could be. But even then, it was really they still ended up, up in the end, didn't they? Sacrificing their children to Moloch. Beloved, the law has never saved anyone, ever. It was only by faith in God that anyone has ever been declared right with God. The crushing pain of the law is obvious. You must be perfect to go to heaven. You must be perfectly righteous in order to go to heaven. <laughs> I, I said that to the the deaf congregation today, again, bringing them to the point of this crushing weight of the law, and you could have seen some of their faces. And at one point, I even told them, one of them said, if I say sorry, doesn't that get me to heaven? And the answer to that question really is what? No. Saying something to God or the God that we make up in our mind is not going to save us either. Forgiveness is costly. <laughs> no amount of works are going to save us. And it's crushing, isn't it? The law, knowing that it tells us what to do. This is even worse because then we make God a liar if we say, I can do it. Because if we say we can keep the law, what are we doing? We are literally saying what God said is not true first. And we're saying what God said for us to do is not really what we should do. Let me drop it down here so I can jump over it. You're calling God a liar by saying you can keep the law to save you. That's a wild thought, isn't it? That's why Paul says what he says. Let him be accursed. But as Paul states in 3.10, he states, For as many as are the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide in by all things written in the book of the law, to perform them. Now, they, that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. For the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, who, who, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That's in the law, by the way. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. We see here clearly that doing the works of the law will justify no one. And then he says in Galatians 3.22, But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ may be given to those who believe. That's it. It's based on faith in Christ alone. So God had a plan, didn't he? Had a plan to save a people for himself. A plan to make spiritual orphans his children. A plan to make slaves to sin and to the law adopted children of God. That is good news, folks. Notice Paul concludes Galatians chapter 3 with these words. He says in verse 23, But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, 
being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now the faith has come. We are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, offsprings, heirs, according to promise. What does this say? This says that the law was given to teach us, to tutor us to Christ, to show us that we needed him. It showed us Christ alone is our only hope. It showed us by faith in him alone can we be declared right with God. It also says that we who have been declared right with God through faith in Jesus are no longer under the impossible burden of trying to keep the law to avoid the wrath of God. We're no longer under that burden. Praise God. Isn't that good news? We are no longer buried under the huge weight of the law. We are, in fact, sons and daughters of God through faith in God. This is truly a, an amazing truth, isn't it? We are children of God. We who believe in Jesus are now in Christ. It says baptized in him. We are in him. We're in his realm of existence. We are literally clothed with the righteousness of Christ. When God sees us, he sees us as his, as his righteous children. Wow. This righteousness is provided to every believer. Whether we are Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free men, whether believer or male, it, the, whether the believer is male or female, we are all saved by faith in Jesus. We are one in the realm of Christ. Period. By the way, this does not mean that there is no longer Jewish believers and Gentile believers. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't say that. The Jew doesn't stop being a Jew or a part of national Israel. That passage does not say that. Because if it said that, let's think about this for a second, then that would mean also that we all stop being male or female. Now, contrary to what our culture says, that it's up to you to decide whether you're a male or female, that's not what this passage is saying. This passage is saying very clearly what? If you are a male or a female, a slave or a free man, a Jew or a Gentile, you are saved by faith alone, in Christ alone. That's what's the point. That's the whole gist. Again, it doesn't say in Romans 9 that God doesn't have a plan for national Israel. It says that not all national Israel is saved Israel. And just like this passage, we're all saved the same way, through faith in Christ alone. That's the point of the passage. And we're all heirs, offsprings of Abraham. And I know some of y'all that are strong dispensationalists, that might push you a little bit, but I, I don't have a problem with it. I think I can be a child of Abraham. Ugh. I think I can actually be called a child of Abraham. Yes, I can sing that song. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had five and Abraham. And you are one of them, and so am I. <laughs> I love the song. <laughs> I don't have a problem with it. I'm not going to die on that hill. I think God can have many sons, and he can have many different plans for within those sons and have roles for them, just like male and female have roles within his people. We're all heirs according to the promise. We're only saved by Christ. We belong to Christ. We are offspring of Abraham. We, are, we all enjoy the blessings of Abraham. By the way, I think that's going to be a hard thing for me at my uh, dissertation. I'm going to have to defend that so you all can pray for me. 
Not every per- promise made to national Israel is shared by us who are in Christ, though. But different, definitely all the promises of the blessings of the new covenant in Christ are ours. So now, Paul illustrates this with our passage. Let's look at our passage. He's going to illustrate this whole idea that we're saved by faith in Christ alone, and he does it with these beautiful pictures. Look at word pictures, Galatians 4.1. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elementary elemental things of the world but when the fullness of the time came God sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law so that we might redeem he might redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons because you are sons God has sent forth the son, spirit of his son into our hearts crying Abba father therefore you are no longer a slave but a son And if a son, then an heir through God. What a passage, right? There is a fourfold explanation of our father's plan to rescue us from this bondage and adopt us into his family. You see it in this passage. We'll go through them. The picture of our previous condition is in verses 1 and 2. The provision of our great Savior is in verses 3 and 4. The purpose of our father's plan is found in verse 5. And then the product products of our adoption in verses 6 and 7. So let's walk down through these. First, the picture of our previous condition. He says in verse 1 and 2, again, I want to read it so you get it and think and listen and focus and get your attention there. Now I say, Paul says, as long as the the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is an owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father by the way just on a side note here this says and this is very clear this is one of the evidences here that the slavery of new testament time is very different than the slavery of the time of the civil war in america it's dramatically different how do i know that well because people in america during the slavery of america did not treat their slaves like their children This is really the end of the discussion on that issue, isn't it? These slaves were different. They were treated as children. Now, granted, that didn't mean that they got anything they wanted. But these slaves did what their master told, the guardians told. And just like the heirs, the children of the one that owned the house, they did what they were told to do. They obeyed. It was different than slavery in America. That was a barbaric practice, and it should have been condemned. And I am ashamed to say that there are many that profess the name of Christ that stood for racism. It is tragic. It's tragic. It's a blight on our country, being honest. We need to own that. At the same time, this passage very clearly says there were forms of slavery that were allowable and God mentions it in the Bible it says slaves obey your masters and masters treat your slaves the proper way okay it's there Paul brings up the coming age though the coming of age process for the child as he compares it and he says he does this as to illustrate his point in the Roman and Jewish cultures children stay, stayed or remain children until the time the father determined the child was an adult. For the Jew, what what year was that? Do y'all know? Thirteen. That's right. A child would have a, a boy would have his bar mitzvah, right? And he would become a an adult, a man. And he would he would literally pledge, and the father would pledge and say, "He's now under the law. He's no longer under me. He's under the law." That was a scary thought. Can you imagine? All parent or all children became under the law. Should have crushed them, right? What did they do, by the way? You know what they do at the bar mitzvahs? 
they stand up and they say, all that God says we will do. Is that not scary? They've said it for thousands of years. I think that's not what God had in mind. But they've twisted it. For the Roman, it was very much the same, but maybe a little bit older, and they would be, they would be determined by the father to be an adult. And guess what happened? They had to give allegiance to the emperor. At that point, they bowed to him, and they did whatever the emperor said or the religion of the de- city. They would stick to, we'll see it in a little bit, the elementary, elemental things of the world. The coming of age in the Roman culture and the, and the Jewish culture was a perfect picture of what it's like waiting on Christ to come, waiting on the reality that we cannot live up to the law. Until they came of age to be a man, they were really no different from a slave. They did exactly what the father said, or they could face discipline. They were also any, anyone the father established over them in the household. They were supposed to do exactly what those managers and guardians said. They did exactly, or they faced what? Consequences. Discipline. So Paul used this to give a word picture for the Galatians to understand the new covenant promises in Christ. He was using the word picture so they could comprehend being under the law was only for a time. But now it's not. It was like the time before a man became or a child became a man. They were under rules, laws, and established religious principles before they were saved. For the Jews, it was that Mosaic law. And for the Gentiles, it was the false religion of their family or the, the emperor. Paul will call these the elementary things, like I said. This is the way the world is today very much. The same, isn't it? It's very much like this. God never intended, however, for the law to save people. But human hearts seek to justify themselves, right? So humanity uses God's law or their own religious rules to justify themselves. And Paul's saying, don't be a child. Don't go back to this wrong thinking. They are in bondage under those rules. They literally think, this is what our world thinks. They think if they don't do them, they are in jeopardy of judgment from their God. This week we had opportunity to go evangelize on campus, and then did it again on Saturday. And this is exactly what I saw from the two Muslims that I witnessed to this week. One of them's name was Muhammad, and I won't give you the other guy's name, but he works with Wes. Different times, same exact thing. They said the same exact thing. Both of them explained to me that they were counting on their good deeds to keep them out of God's judgment. They believed by following these elementary thing, elemental things of the world, they could justify themselves before God. They did the prayers. Both of them said they prayed five times a day on a mat looking towards Mecca, looking towards that area. Why? Because they said that that's how God will accept them. If they will do that, God will then accept them. They have to do it exactly like he wants, or their people say they should do it, and often say exactly what they said. It was very interesting. One of the guys asked us, well, how do you pray? And I said, oh, I'll I'll give you an example. You want to hear us pray? We'll go ahead and pray right here. No, 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 don't do that. (laughs) Don't do that. No, really, just let me, I'll just tell you what I say. And I looked at him and I said, You know, I say, Father, Heavenly Father, I love you. I'm a a sinner. You know that. But you sent your son to die for me. You're so good. I love you. Help me not blow it today. Help me honor your name today. It was an intimate prayer. It's how we pray, right? It's how we talk to God. That's our Father. And he was blown away by it was shocking to him. 
Why? Because he thinks his God is so separate, so set up different that he can't achieve. He st- both of them said if they were really honest Muslims, they can't say that they're going to heaven. They're, I'm hoping I will be good enough. But really, even if I do everything I can do, I could get, still get to heaven and God could say, sorry, nope, you're out of here. Didn't balance out enough. Didn't have enough good deeds. Isn't that, isn't that horrible bondage? That's where they are. We're more like slaves than children, right? Under bondage to the law, under bondage to man-made religions. But God... <laughs> What a God. Notice the provision of our great Savior. So also we. While we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son. Born of a woman, born under the law. Oh, man. Paul clearly lays it out. He transitions, doesn't he? The provision is not... Me cleaning myself up. It's not me being good enough to be accepted by God. It's not me at all because I'm under bondage if I'm trying to make it about me, right? Trying to be good enough, please. I'll make a God and give me some religion so that I can somehow have that God accept me. But it's bondage. And he makes this, he moves the illustration to make this point. While we were children, we were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. There is a debate over what exactly these elemental things of the world is. Again, like I said, I don't, I don't think it has to be super specific. And I don't think he is being specific. I think he's leaving it as general as possible so that it kind of gets all of it together, if that makes sense. In other words, even if they're the Judaizers, they've taken the Mosaic Law and they've twisted it and really lowered it so that people can jump over the bar and therefore get it. So it's, it's messed up. You can't, he wouldn't say the law because if he said the law, what? It's really a distortion of the law. But at the same time, it want, he wants to incorporate all false religions that are based on what? Works. What you do. So he includes them. And you see that in verses 8 to 11. Notice. It says, however, at that time... When you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. There's your idols that he's talking about. But now you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God. How is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? Question. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. What is that? saying real clear, the context of elemental things is man-made laws and practices and standards that are established to earn favors of that false god. Listen, folks, you are never going to be good enough to earn the one true God's favor. Never. You can't. You can be the best person in the world and you're still going to what? Fail miserably. You're going to deserve hell for eternity. We see that in when Jesus lays out the law, right? Matthew 5. If you look upon a woman with lust in your heart, you've what? Committed adultery in your heart and you deserve hell. Or if you call a person a fool. Anybody, anybody call anybody a name this week? In anger, boom, you're dead. You deserve hell. That's the real line. That's called the hurdle that's impossible, right? Anybody, it's like jumping to the moon. Anybody in here can jump to the moon? You can't. It's crushing, isn't it? They were told by the false teachers called Judaizers that they must keep the Sabbath, keep the festivals to be saved. You must do these things or you're really not saved. 
Again, these false teachers had taken the law of Moses, lowered it down so that they could jump over it because they knew they could jump over that. I can keep the law. I can keep the Sabbath. I can keep the festivals because after all, I was raised doing it all my life. No big deal for me to celebrate Hanukkah. But the fact of the matter is, is that was just them what? Self-justifying themselves and ignoring the glory of Christ and saying, Jesus isn't enough. So Paul states, this is how we were. We were in bondage under these things back in 4, 1 to 7. The element thing, element, elemental things of the world. We weren't saved then. We were slaves then. We may have orda been ordained for sonship eventually, but we were living under bondage to works righteousness. Friends, this is a horrifying place to be, and if you're in that place right now, I want you to know, if you think it's based on what you do that gets you to heaven, you are in a very, very dark place. It's a very, very grieving place. So you have the danger, and the danger includes this. It makes you the hero. It makes you the one that gets all the praise when you get to heaven. I did it! <laughs> I was good enough. Can you imagine in the Muslim religion or in false Judaism, what happens when people get to heaven? They're standing ovations for the people. You did it! Way to go! That is definitely a false religion, right? Who should get the praise? Only God. By the way, it defames the holiness of God. It's amazing. Muslims say that God is so holy and set apart and distinct that they can't even approach him. But in fact, they make it about those five things. So what do they really do? They take his holiness and go down like this. They drop it over, drop it down so that they can achieve it. That's what, that's what Roman Catholicism has done. Go to your priest, confess your sins to him. Pray the rosary five times, and God will accept you. Wrong! It made it about you. Children of God don't think that way. True children of God don't think that way. It burdens us if we're unable to live up to the standard. That's why, don't you see this? There's, either, there's one of two ways that you respond to this kind of law-giving living, living by the law. One, you either walk around constantly thinking you're garbage. Like, I'm nothing. I'm a failure. I'm horrible. Or you walk around thinking, I'm pretty good. I'm better than that guy over there. I should be okay in heaven. Do you understand both of those are wrong? And both of those are filled with pride. Why is it filled with pride to walk around going, oh, <laughs> I'm miserable. Let me just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow. I die. I'm going to hell. I'm just going to have at it. What's wrong with that? No submission. Doing whatever you want to do. Thinking that if you grovel enough, God might have mercy on you. You feel sorry enough for yourself. I have the God. That's what people will, they don't say it this way. I have the God that accepts those that grovel. Those that just feel bad about themselves. Woe is me. Maybe God will then accept me. You know what that is? Heresy. Rejection of God. Both ways are wrong. Pridefully thinking that we're, we're good enough for God to accept us. Oh, my. For what we do, one last thing. What do we do? We take and we... Great sin, and I hope everybody's listening to this. This is so important. This sin is really bad. So that really bad sin, I don't do that, so I'm okay. This sin over here, it's not that bad. I do it. Matter of fact, I do it every day, but it's okay. Compared to that sin, at least I'm not a murderer or a pedophile. I'm okay. 
God doesn't work that way. God's holy. He's perfect. He's just. He's righteous. No sin goes unpunished. Right? So, are we crushed? How many of you? How many of you disobeyed God this week? How many of you were unkind towards somebody? Thought it in your heart. Didn't say it. <laughs> right? At least I kept it inside and didn't let it come out here. I meditated on it for 30 hours. <laughs> no, I, I know. We, there's a little bit of a... When we do things like this, and I want you to listen, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a natural inside of us a tension to kind of want to release that. And you know what I mean? You're like, oh, yeah, I did that. <laughs> But do you understand that it's not funny? Do you understand? Do you realize that if we were standing before a holy God thinking those thoughts, we would deserve what? Boom. Gone. Forever. It should crush us, right? It's, I, I get why you do it. I understand. It's that tension reliever. Oh, I gotta let that off. I don't want to walk around constantly thinking any moment I could be fried. Right? Here's the issue, though. What do you do with that? What do you do with your sin? What do you. I said this to the. Again, the death. That you say, I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry, God. Please forgive me. And he goes, yeah, sure. You said forgive me, so okay. Or ask for forgiveness, so you're, you're okay. No big deal. Come here. I love you. Does he do that? The answer is yes, but the cost of it is extremely costly. See, because, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Do you see, folks? You know, it'll make you look at your sin in a whole different light, won't it? You know, if the last time you were kind of thinking bad thoughts about the person, you thought, oh, this is why Jesus was born of a woman, born under the law, and died for me then maybe we would turn from that sin and turn to God a little quicker, wouldn't we? We don't. We often forget, unfortunately. These are glorious truths, though, here in verse 4, aren't they? But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son. What do we say to that? Glory to God, this is good news, isn't it? I was a slave under the law. I was failing miserably. But God, at the right time, the Father sent the Son. At the perfect time in His providence, He knew when the world was ready for His Son. He was ready to show off His glory. At the exact right time, He sent His Son. The Trinity, one of the members of the Trinity came into the world. The Father determined that time. It does, it does say that our hope is only in God. It says God sent forth his Son. So what doesn't it say? I want you to think about this for a second. At the right time, at the fullness of time, he determined that if you grovel, I'll forgive you. At the right time, if you clean yourself up a little bit better than most people, I'll forgive you. No, God never said anything like that. At the right time, he sent his son into the world to die for us wicked, rebellious, sinful people. Oh, this is glory, isn't it? These are... 
Amazing words. God sent his son. We sinned. We were in bondage. We were condemned. We were under a, an impossible standard. But God sent his son. We were here. God the Father saw us. And he sent his son to rescue us. Redeem us. Free us from bondage to that law. Notice how he came. Notice it says, born of a woman, born under the law. These are remarkable, too, amazing truths, things that we just need to sit and meditate on. You need to think on that phrase, born of a woman. Beloved, do you understand the creator of the universe made everything? He made it all, and the son that was participating in that creation, he made it. He's not created He's a creator. He became a baby in a womb. A little baby. That's shocking, isn't it? Why? Because of your bondage to the law. Because your inability to keep the law. Because of your sinfulness. He became a man. That is the most loving and gracious and kind act in all the world. God became a man. He was born of a woman to save humanity. He had to be 100% God and 100% man. He had to be a man. He had to be a human to redeem humans. And he came. But then it gets even more shocking. Born under the law. Born under the law. What? Now, when you think about this phrase, do you understand? You could probably preach a whole sermon on this one phrase, born under the law. I want you to understand, God has a moral righteous standard. And I want you to listen closely. That moral righteous standard is perfection. And did you know that you have to obey perfectly to go to heaven you have to obey perfectly now when I said that in the death service there was some moving around in the chair there were some people in what listen to me listen closely you have to have obeyed God from the every second of your life in action word deed and thought your entire life. If you don't have that perfection, that righteousness, you are going to hell. At this point, there may be some in the room saying, I'm out of here. This guy is a heretic. There went one. I hope and pray that I didn't offend you. There's more to it. I promise. That was very strange. Hear me out. God expects perfect obedience. And it's the only way you're going to heaven. It's a fact. So how are we going to heaven? He was born under the law. The son came to the earth and was under the law. And he obeyed perfectly. Every second, every thought, every deed, he obeyed perfectly under the law. And you say, well, what's that have to do with me? He just, that condemns me even more. Because the fact of the matter is, is if he did it perfectly, then that means I have no excuse. Because a human did it. And I couldn't. But he was born under the law so that the righteous fulfillment of the law could be fulfilled. 
for those who would believe in Him. And so therefore, His righteous acts are credited to whose account? Mine, if I believe in Him. As I trust in Him, all of His righteous deeds, every obedient act, He followed the law perfectly, is put in my account. What a God! What a God! The Father looks at me and says, Righteous son, because my righteous son. You, fa- you have faith in my righteous son. His righteousness credited to my account, my sin was put on him at the cross, and he paid for all my sin on top of that. What a great exchange, right? This truth should be enough to make us all just fall on our face and worship God the rest of our lives. Obedience should not even be a problem for us. We should be walking around, yes, Lord, whatever you say. All my sin paid for and all his righteousness credited to my account because he fulfilled what the law demanded. That's why we can be in Christ. We can have all the promises and we are co-heirs with him. Why? Because he did it. He gets all the praise, doesn't he, today? In this room, he gets all the praise. None of us in the room say, I'm pretty good. None of us think that we're something, do we? We exalt the master, the king, the one who was born under the law. I wish, guys, y'all pray for those three people that left. It's so grieving to me. They didn't get to hear that truth. We don't think we're better than anybody, do we? Sinners, aren't we? It's only by the grace of God that he sent his son into the world to die for sinners like us. But why did he do it? Why did he do it? And this is just shocking. This should jump off the page. This purpose should jump off the page. You should be going, what? He did it so that he might redeem those who are under the law. And second, so that we might receive the adoption of sons. Why did he do it? Why was he born under the law? So that he could free us from being under the law. We're no longer in bondage. We're no longer under this works righteousness mentality that says I have to be good enough to get there. I'm redeemed from that. And if you believe in him and you've repented and believed in him, you're redeemed from it too. And also, so that you may receive the adoption of sons. Oh, folks, do you see perfect trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, always in perfect relationship, always in beautiful, perfect relationship. Father sends the Son. Why does he send the Son? So that... The the way they are one, we can be one with them too. That we can literally be adopted into his family. This is shocking, isn't it? Sinners like us, worthy of hell, can be considered and adopted and brought into the family of God as his children. Why? Because of the son's work. Because of what Christ did for us. The guy asked, what what keeps you from just doing all the sin you want to do? One of the Muslims. What keeps you from doing? I mean, if I knew that I was forgiven because somebody else paid for my fine and paid for all my sin, why don't I just sin all the more? Why, why don't I just let it rip? I'm a child of God. I can do whatever I want. And God's going to love me because I'm his son. And the answer to that is, is because I love my father. He first loved me. My heavenly father loves me so much that he sacrificed his own son for me. What in the world would I want to do anything other than just love him? 
that would be crazy. Can't, it, that, that doesn't make any sense, does it, for the believer? The believer that knows that Christ died for them and fulfilled all the law for them, we just want to do exactly what the Son did and make much of the Son because the Son is the one that did it for us. Our adoption should cause us to praise Jesus all the more. The reason for our praise of him is clear because he made our adoption possible. What a good God, right? The amazing thing is, is there's even more products, more produce. Look at this. Finally, because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I hope you all are starting to get this picture. Are you starting to understand it a little bit? Do you understand what it means to be a part of God's family? Do you understand that now we have access to God? <laughs> do, let me ask you, parents. Do you, do you love it when your kids, even when they blow it, they look up at you with tears running down their eyes and they say, Daddy, I blew it. I love you. Will you forgive me? How many parents go, Nope. <laughs> uh -uh. I want you to go work a little bit. Make up for it. By the way, be very careful, parents. Be very careful. You can fall back into this. You can start doing things like this. You can start saying, well, you know, you shouldn't have done that. And you know, how long am I going to have to tell you? Oh, this is, oh, my. I'm going to hold off on giving you a nice, big, loving hug until you fix this. What did we just do? We gave him the full wrong view of God. Now, that doesn't mean you don't discipline. We'll talk about discipline later. It's coming. But I will tell you this. A broken and contrite heart that comes to a parent, uh, to a parent and says, I'm sorry, I blew it, needs to be received with what? I love you. Come here. I love you. Don't make it about what you do to earn their affection. What they do, rather, to earn your affection. Because then you'll have kids that are always what? Trying to earn your affection. And they will make a God in their own minds that's just like you. That should petrify every parent in the room. Do you understand? I don't want to be my children's man-made God. I want my children to know that I love them. I love them. They are my children. I love them unconditionally. Now, does that mean I have to agree with everything they do? No. But they need to understand that my love is not based on how good or bad they are. Praise God, right? We want them to say, we want them to do what? Call out, Abba, Father. <laughs> How are you going to cry out, Abba, Father, if you constantly are thinking that I'm just not good enough for God? You're not going to cry out that. But the Spirit of God that's dwelling within the believer affirms in us that God is a merciful and loving God because he sent his Son to die for us. I want to be that kind of father to my kids. And I want to go to this God all the time because it's the God of the Bible. We must be careful of making God out to be that wretched slave owner that can never be pleased because he's not that way. Therefore, you are no longer a slave you're no longer under the bondage of the law, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. 
And all God's people say, so thankful that I'm an heir to the king. Not because I deserve it, but because of what Christ did for me. So you've blown it this week. Anybody blow it this week? Yeah, you blew it this week. Don't clean yourself up. Run to the one who loves you. Run to Abba Father, and he will clean you up. Knowing his love will produce obedience. You will want to obey your father because you will know that your sins are covered. He is our hope, right? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness and your goodness towards us. We pray that you will help us, Lord, to always remember this truth. Help us to not be people that are trying to achieve a right standing or earn your favor. We do want to please you, Father, but the difference between pleasing you, Father, is one of heart motivation our heart motivated because of your love for us and for your kindness towards us. Yes, we love you. Yes, we know you love us. Help us now, Lord, to obey you. Thank you for making us your children, adopting us into your family. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.